that's what we were just joking about. We wanted yeah. a few minutes to finish the chapters. I think actually this was the longest chunk, um, three chapter chunk out of the whole thing. So if you were able to get through um, chapter seven, eight, nine, that was, it's going to be smooth sailing from here, right? Um, so do, you, do you want to get right into it? Because we, we're so far behind here and we don't want to keep people out too well, What, what else would you like to do, Tim? Well, I what know you, you guys- suggesting? You, a game I mean, of Yahtzee? Yeah. <laughs> we could do some charades or something just to kick oh, things yeah. off. That'd be a great idea. <clears throat> Yeah, no. So, uh, we should, yeah, we should probably get started. Yeah, let's let's get into it. Um, so, uh, like I said, we're on chapters seven, eight, and nine. It's getting fun now because uh, we're getting into some of the Columbo stuff and how to respond when people use Columbo against you. And so, if I look here in my notes, do you guys do paper notes? Uh, like, pa well, paper? no. I I take notes in the book and then I transcribe into a little note taking um app yeah but i don't know i yeah yeah you know. for some reason i i just love having a pen in hand mm -hmm. and so yeah and then what i'll end up doing it's more work and somebody asked me about this it, so i don't recommend it but i end up going from my notes and if i want it on if i want a digital copy i'll just type it out in kind of more developed my notes on on paper are usually um something only i can understand yeah um so anyways we're on chapter seven and uh this is colombo step number three using questions to make a point which i think is actually the hardest of the three steps right yeah the first two steps um what do you mean by that how did you come to that conclusion these are just you know here's your question uh but when it comes to Columbo three, you need to actually know where you're going. <coughs> as, as Greg puts it, you got to have a target that you're shooting at, right? And if you don't have the target in mind, then you can't even you can't even do step three. Um, and so let me throw it at you guys. I got John normally where on my screen normally where Alan is for some reason, and so I'm gonna go to John. Can I go to you first and uh, and find out what you like? or didn't like about uh, chapter seven? Yeah, I mean, I actually, of the three chapters, I think I probably like this, uh, that we had to read this week. I like this one the most. Um, ah, I don't know, we'll see when we get to the next one. Um, are we just, so we're just staying with chapter, the first chapter? Yeah, let's go with chapter seven and then we'll- Go on, okay. Um, I thought that, the, like what you said, this is the most challenging chapter. Like it's the most challenging part of the tactic because you have to have a little bit more. We talked about this last time. We have to have a little bit more knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, uh, it's also kind of like that exclamation point at the end of the sentence too, where you're listening to somebody and you're asking questions and you're kind of out there on a fact-finding mission. And this is an opportunity for you to say, wait, wait, wait a second. Hold on. What you're saying doesn't maybe make a little sense. And it's time for you to put that stone in somebody's shoe, which is always an exciting time of the conversation. And oh man, so for me, the most helpful part of learning this is I feel like that's the moment of confrontation that's the most awkward. Yeah. You know, uh, listening and asking questions is really easy once you get the hang of it. It's uh, kind of interjecting and saying, well, I think you might be wrong uh, where, where conversations you, you start to feel the pressure. And I think that this, I think that Greg's tactic here in this step three is uh, is really good at making that a little bit easier for you. You know, like finding the flaw in in somebody's conversation. It just comes through listening and and a lot of times. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm doing this with people, I, I always think of my family because my family, everybody, I'm the only Christian in my my side of the family. And whenever I'm talking, and and I everybody's a relativist. Mm. Uh, so, so whenever I'm talking to people and I'm just like, it, 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 there's so many opportunities to, to do this type of stuff and say, wait a second, I just thought, so you just said that there's no such thing as moral absolutes, you know, but how come now you're saying, and I'm just throwing this out there, but now you're saying Donald Trump is the most immoral person that's ever walked the planet, you know, and then this time in our political history is fantastic for this, you know, and, and I don't care about the politics, to be honest with you. I, I care about the, the larger conversation, you know, ultimately. Yeah. Um, uh, a worldview conversation. 
So as a whole, I thought I, I really liked this chapter because it helps us move into the hard part of the conversations, I think. Yeah, it's good. <clears throat> Did I get it right? Yeah, you got yeah. the right answer. Yeah, good job. Yeah. One for one. <laughs> nice work. Let's see, Let's see hey, how you Jesus. do it next. Chapter. Yeah. What, if, what about you, Alan? <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I. you know, this is the chapter that, well, I should say this, this is the step that if you can go from Columbo one and two questions to this one, this will help you go a long ways towards making huge inroads. Um, and, and, you know, being people's, um, well, to see in thinking here and there and to, to be able to graciously uncover that for the other person. If you can do that, man, th that is golden. Um, I want to give an example of an opportunity I had when talking to a friend of mine a number of years ago. He was a Hindu guy. And um, he told me he's going to be getting married. And so I decided to just kind of go into um, fact-finding mode, just kind of Columbo one and two questions. And so yeah. my first question to him was, I said, okay, are, are you going to have a, a Hindu wedding or an American-style wedding? And he goes, oh, I'm going to have a Hindu wedding. I said, cool. So I asked him another question. I said, um, is Hinduism something that's important to you? He's like, yeah, it's important. I said, cool. So I asked him another question. I said, uh, and this is all over lunch, so it was casual or whatever. He was just trying to tell me the good news. He's getting married. I said, do you believe Hinduism is true? He goes, yeah, I think Hinduism is true. I'm like, okay, cool. So I asked him another question. I said, do you believe all religions are true? Like not just Hinduism, but Islam and Buddhism and Christianity and Judaism and so on and so forth. Yeah. He thought about it for a moment. He finally said, yeah, I think all religions are basically the same. Now, at this point of the conversation, I, I realized that my friend – his name is Raj, is what we would call a religious pluralist, right? All religions are true. And of course, as a Christian, that's not something that I believed. And so at that point in the conversation, all I had done was just ask, you know, Columbo type one questions, you know, what do you mean by that? Tell me more about that. What's your view on that? What do you think about that? So they were just sort of fact finding kinds of questions. Yeah. So now I had, a, I had some knowledge about what he believed, where he stood, and then kind of like what you're saying, Tim, I now had a target I wanted to shoot for. And that target was I wanted him to abandon this idea that all religions could be could be true. So then I asked him one, one final question. I said, I said, Raj, what would you think about a religion that teaches there's a God that is physical in nature, that's the size of a football field and hovers on the far side of the moon? And then this God controls our weather patterns, the weather patterns on our planet. I said, would you believe that a religion that teaches that is true? Like you said, all, all religions are true. So he started thinking about it for a moment. He began to smile and he goes, okay, he goes, no, I, I take it back. He goes, all right. He goes, not all religions are true, only the ones that make sense. And so notice he backed, <laughs> away, and he backed away from that initial claim that all religions are true. Yeah. And so that third question was, you know, what this chapter is about, right? The, you know, using questions to make a point. I used the knowledge that I had gained with those first two Columbo questions to gain knowledge to know, okay, I see what his view is and I see the problem with it. Now I'm going to use a question uh, to, to make a point. And that is you can't really sustain this idea that all religions are true because some of them just make, you know, ridiculous. So anyway, so yeah, I, I don't always do that. I, I sometimes struggle to find out how to, couch the point I want to make it a question, but if you can do it, man, it's it's incredibly powerful. And in that case, it worked really well because he completely backtracked from his claim that all religions were true just by me asking him questions. I, I didn't even tell him I was a Christian or even defend any aspect of me being a, a, a Christian. Yeah. So yeah, this chapter is gold, man. If you can if you can go from the first two Columbo questions to this, man, you can you can make a lot of progress in conversations. It's great. So how do you think you get there? Because um, this one's this one's harder, right? You, it's not simply um, something you can necessarily just. Well, here's the question. I know what to do now. It's it's you gotta you, you gotta respond on the fly. So how do we? You know, people watching, um, what advice can we give them um, to get better at this? Well, I'll go first. I'll say uh, two things that come to mind for me, and it's one that I've been repeating, I think, throughout our our episodes. 
One is just is just um, studying and gaining knowledge about all kinds of things, ethics, religion, theology, law, whatever. The more knowledge you have, the more likely it is that when you're in a conversation with someone, you'll be able to recognize a mistake of, in their thinking. And then if you know these tactics, you'll be able to uh, use that knowledge and your tactics in combination to be able yeah. to, you know, use this particular approach. The third third question here in chapter seven. So that's one thing. It's just just spending time devoting yourself to learning. And the second thing I'd say, and this is something that Greg brings up in chapter eight, and that is to practice. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you can practice before you have an encounter with someone. You could practice after you've had an encounter, or not practice, but like kind of um, think about how you did. And then you can also ask people for feedback, you know, if they're in a conversation with you, you know, like maybe, you know, Tim, if you and I were in a conversation with somebody who wasn't a believer after we ha end up that after we end that conversation, you know, you and I can kind of talk about like, Hey, how did we do? Or here's what you did that you could have worked on, or here's what I could have done that was better or whatever, you know? So I think those two things can make, uh, <clears throat> make it possible for anybody to be able to do this stuff. And people may not realize this, but uh, even, you know, on Tuesdays at staff meeting, uh, quite often, you know, we'll we'll recount or retell how something happened in the field. You know, this is I mean, not specifically right now where we're not traveling and doing all that. But we'll <laughs> often, um, you know, months ago, we would have sat down and said, hey, you know, this came up during Q&A or this person came up to me afterwards. Here's how I responded. How could I have done this better or what question could yeah. I have asked? And, you know, we end up just throwing this around with each other. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's not like, you know, we're the professional apologists, so we have all the answers. Um, it's, we're learning just like everybody else when it comes to Yeah. That. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So for me, the, um, the chapter had a lot of good stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to repeat the stuff you guys just said. Um, he makes the point of finding um, points of agreement I think this is a really good strategy. Um, you know, it's you a sales tactic. It's yeah. Well, kind of. Well, you you want to um, find common ground. I think I mentioned this um, maybe last week or the week before, but I think this is Paul's approach. Um, he he. Well, at least maybe not find maybe not the common ground, but he at least finds a point of agreement. You know, when he, in Acts seventeen, when he says, "You guys are very religious." Oh you yeah. Know? He, it's almost as if he's saying, me too, I'm religious too, but not in the way you guys are. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you guys have this altar to the unknown God and he goes from there. He has a, uh, a springboard. So um, I thought that was really key because it really brings the walls down. You know, if you can say, hey, you know, we're on the same page when it comes to this. He, he used the illustration. I actually think it's a good one. If you want to do evangelism, this one, two step, that um greg does i think it's with the lawyer at the at the bookstore oh yeah where he says he asked the two questions do you think people who commit moral crimes ought to be punished i mean you it doesn't matter if you're talking to a lawyer or not you could ask anyone that question and then follow it up with have you ever committed any moral crimes i mean those that two-step right there um to me that besides this tactic, that's just a great thing to ask someone, you know, if you, if you're going to ask any question, why not ask that one? Um, and then you can, that's the bad news right there. And then you got the opportunity to give the good news. Right. Yeah. And so to me, that was just a great insight. Um, I loved how, you know, he talks about being innocent as doves and, uh, and, Goodness. and wise and serpents. And of course um, this is, you know, Greg offering these, I love how he has set up these kind of model questions, mm -hmm. you know, can you clear this up for me? You know, that kind of, it's soft, it's gentle, you know, he's thought and he's tested this right in the field. And so um, for me anyways, that's helpful. Um, so Columbo three doesn't have a specific question that you're going to be able to ask every time. Right. But he does offer those kinds of, well, use this approach, you know, can you clear this up for me and then go from there? Um, or, you know, we, we agree on this point, but what about this? Um, so, uh, but he also, he also talks about like, don't worry if you stall, you know, if the conversation stalls, let it stall. Don't, don't force something. Yeah. You know, I think that that's a major point 
of the, the whole book in general and just just being uh evangelistic minded at least um is to take the, take the weight off yourself you know it's it's number one it's not your job to convert anybody you couldn't convert anybody even if you wanted to so that's not your point the point is the stone in the shoe and if we constantly remember that i'm just trying to get somebody to think about something and in the process I'm hoping one uh, to have a, a good, friendly conversation with somebody. Uh, in the process of that, I'm able to maybe uh, break through some stereotypes that this person, especially if they're an ardent skeptic like I was, and when I started having conversations with people who were a little bit more tactical in their approach with me, I started abandoning my my um, my biases against Christians being. You know, uh, the people standing on the street corner, you're going to burn in hell uh, type of people. I'm like, oh, wait, these people are actually intelligent. They're giving me something to think about. So, yeah. and I like that he says, when the conversation stalls, let it stall. You know, it's over. Yeah, let's die a natural death. Yeah. Yeah. Just thanks. Thanks for the conversation. I mean, that's, that's, a, I use that one a lot. You know, I just say thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. I hope I've given you something to think about. You know. Nice. We're done. That's good. Okay, let's go to uh let's go to chapter eight. You guys get to go to chapter eight? Yeah. Go to chapter eight. Uh so chapter eight, perfecting Columbo. Um any uh any key takeaways? It's not a long chapter, John, but uh is there anything that you want to highlight, bring up? Yeah. Um I, I like the point that he kind of draws out about, and this is, it, it's funny. A lot of this is going back to, I, I so the, the last time that we got together last week, uh, for some reason, the major thing I took away from it was uh, a sense of having to have this knowledge, a base of knowledge in order to have conversations. And right. our conversation that we had just got me thinking about it. So maybe that's why this stuff is popping out at me this week. But, um, you know, as you're having conversations, you're trying, Greg points out in the book, you're trying to, um, how does he say it, uh, anticipate, you're trying to anticipate objections. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is, this is part of the learning process. So as yeah. you're talking to somebody and you're trying to remember, the whole thing is about staying in control of the conversation. And if you're in control of the conversation, it goes back to that target idea. Like you, you want to know, you have an idea of where you want to go. Greg also discusses it in, there's an article, um, or maybe it's a talk he gives, um, I think it's called like No Roadkill. Yeah. Something. And yeah, it's yeah. really, it's really interesting. And, and I paid attention to this because I've related it to my kids even, uh, where when I go to the store and I park, and, and, and so, so I pack the car and uh, I say, okay, hey girls, we're going to that store right there. Um, you know, we're going to walk. And I always say, what are we, what are we walking through right now? And they all go a packing lot. And I say, okay, what are we looking for? And they all go, we're looking for cars. And I say, absolutely. You know, you look for the white lights. And so I'm holding their hand and guiding them through. It's the same thing in this chapter. I feel like as we seek, as we become better at this and we become more knowledgeable, we're able to guide the conversations and anticipate objections that are going to be coming to us. Um, so, one, I think the conversations get simpler and, or easier, I should say, maybe not simpler, but easier to have because yeah. uh, there's only so many objections that really are out there. Mm -hmm. You know, normally when I'm having conversations with my family or friends, they're centered around maybe three or four, five at most different issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I can anticipate what they're going to say next. And that helps me lead the conversation. Um, and then it also helps me formulate answers ahead of time. So I'm not actually having to think necessarily on the fly. It's more just uh, recalling. It's kind of like muscle memory. Um, like Jay Warner Wallace talks about that a lot, you know, in the context of his previous career. Right. Um, there's a lot of muscle memory that's involved. And it's the same thing with this. And in, in our uh, tactical conversations, uh, we can rely on the, the previous knowledge that we have, anticipate objections so that we can offer uh, a robust answer and hopefully put that stone in somebody's shoe. Anyways, this was a good chapter. This was my favorite chapter this week. Oh, Definitely not the next one, but the, that one, this one. <laughs> so anyways, that's my takeaway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so for me, I think um, I think one of the challenges of, of just the whole book tactics is that um, you, 
you want to look, you, you see Greg do this and you see how effective it is and you want to do it yourself, but <laughs> you try it and it, sometimes it doesn't, well, not, not sometimes, oftentimes doesn't work. And it's just because we're not as good at it as he is. And so, you know, it's important as you were asking Tim earlier when we were talking about the previous chapter, like how do you then get better at it? How do you, how do you improve? How do you practice? And, and on page, pages 116 through 117, uh, in the section um, improving your footwork. Um, he talks a little bit about this, and I think the mm -hmm. the concept that I I love the most that he brings up there is going back to the ambassador model that he introduced at the beginning, which is you know the Bible identifies us in Second Corinthians five twenty that we're all ambassadors for Christ, and then of course that's standard reason we're always talking about well what does it mean to be an ambassador? You got to have three skills: knowledge, wisdom, character. And so he says, after you've had an encounter with someone, you've talked to some person, whether they're a Christian or not, it doesn't matter, but you've had a conversation, you've tried to use your tactics, or maybe you didn't, or you maybe just everything fell flat. After you walk away from that conversation, you use the ambassador motif as a, um, as a guide for helping you reflect on where you could have improved. So you ask yourself the question regarding the three, the three skills, knowledge, wisdom, character. Okay, how did I do in the area of knowledge? You know, did I, was I aware of all the facts that I needed to know in order for me to be effective here? You know, the wisdom part, you know, did I maneuver properly in the conversation? Was I always taking on the burden of proof or was I shifting the burden of proof back on the other person where it belongs? You know, uh, and that would be the wisdom part. And then the character part, you know, um, you know, was I kind? Was I gracious? Was I winsome? Um, so, so breaking down your self assessment, your self reflection part in those mm -hmm. three categories to me is, is so critical at improving your ability to do these tactics because it's just a nice framework. And I think those are the three areas that we all need to work on as an ambassador for Christ. So I don't know, to me, that was, that was the big takeaway. I, I love that little section. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's the only way to grow. And so anticipate challenges beforehand. Of course, you can't anticipate them all. And you're going to get into situations where you don't know how to respond. And so you reflect afterwards. So good. And uh, and there are times, I mean, I've been in situations where I didn't use my Columbo tactics. You know, and I, I just, I jumped in head first and it was a huge mistake or I was too, way too aggressive. Um, and, uh, maybe sarcastic or snarky, you know, some of us who have sarcasm as a love language, <laughs> that's, that's hard, right? We have to keep that in check, um, when we're responding to people mm -hmm. and it's oftentimes, you know, you got to keep the inside voice inside, you know, um, so you don't hurt someone's feelings or whatever. Uh, so so all of these are, this is really good. I always, I find myself not only, you know, reflecting back and thinking, um, you know, what question could have been better, but also thinking about that character piece and how could I, have, how could I have done better in that respect? So that's, uh, that's really good. I love this chapter because it shows that Greg Kokel is human, right? <laughs> like he, cause you, 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 we see him on a, on a, uh, weekly basis on the radio show interacting with people and he just seems to you know have a lot of good responses he's very thoughtful you know i'll send him a message or or give him a call if i have a tough question and he just seems to have like you know this knowledge that very few people have and uh so when when you can read in the book about him you know not using colombo i think it was this chapter where he describes right how he just finished giving a talk on colombo yeah. and then doesn't even use the method i've been there i've done that <laughs> right i've i've done the exact same thing so it's uh yeah he he, he walks he's, he's done preaching he goes to the back to welcome everybody or greet everybody as they're leaving the church some lady goes this is page 119 she goes i'm a christian and a buddhist and a pagan and he goes well it sounds to me like you don't know very much about those religions <laughs> And I could honestly, see, I could, I could hear him say. I totally that. can hear him say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, that's good. Look, we got, and there's some good chat going on the side here. Um, Paul, he mentioned um, 
few minutes ago, you know, you don't always have to hit a home run. You just put a stone in the shoe. And this is something, you know, we are constantly saying, we're constantly telling this to people, right? Um, that this is our, this is our approach. Um, Ashton, really good comment. Um, you're right, John, we're all not called to be harvesters. So we need to stop setting that as our goal. Um, really good stuff. And then of course, Ash Ashton was like, what, you don't all have the answers. <laughs> we don't have all the answers. <clears throat> no, we do not. Um, okay. Let's, uh, let's you guys want to move on to chapter nine yeah sure we're, we're, going, to we're going pretty good here yeah because um, it's so late <laughs> yeah 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 that's it's part of the issue maybe we're we're trying to put the pedal to the metal now knowing that uh we started late so chapter nine is a new chapter it wasn't in the it wasn't in the um or you know what it, maybe it was but it wasn't fully developed like it is um he definitely Greg added some stuff, um, in particular in response to Peter Bogosian's work, which oh, we yeah. can talk about. Um, so chapter nine is called Turnabout, Defending Against Columbo. And uh, and so, um, John, we were in a, a book club together, kind of a secret book club. I don't know how that happened years ago, right? Yeah, and years ago? Was it or was it last? I mean, I've it lost was all. Last year, wasn't it? It was before but, I left the the church. Before I w went back to the first. Yeah, it was <clears throat> probably two years. Oh my gosh! So two years we ago. Have, it feels like it's been a while. Anyways, and so we would we would read books that we didn't agree with, um, just to see what they're saying and talk about it. And um, one of the books we read was from Peter Bogosian, who's a philosopher at Portland State University. He is um, an atheist and he's actually written a book um, kind of like tactics. I mean, I say it's kind of like it, but it, I mean, it's a, his motivation is completely different. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to get people out of religion. Yeah, but his okay? tactics are completely different too. They, they are, they are. And his motivation, I mean, he's not trying to um, make a case at all. He's just trying to get doubt to, to cause doubt in the believer any way possible. And Greg does a good way of pointing this out. Even if you use a non sequitur, even if you use, uh, you know, an, a formal fallacy, right? right. Uh, in, in your right. argument, um, he considers that a win. Um, I mean, Peter Bergosian should know better as a philosopher, right? Um, but he um, will resort to any tactic as long as it accomplishes the goal of getting someone to doubt uh, their faith, which he calls a, a virus, by the way. And so um, this is, I mean, this is related to what he's talking about. There's, there's often times where tactics, questions can be used against the believer. And so, um, John, was there something in this chapter that uh, you, you thought noteworthy <clears throat> or um, um, an insight you want to bring? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch to talk about. The stuff addressing Bogosian, I think, is worth probably worth uh worth your time uh and i say that not just you guys but everybody who's kind of watching um certainly to at least start to think about how to respond to people like bogosian because they're getting more and more common um and one of the one of the ways that i liked one of the things i i this just chapter to be honest with you, is like and i think alan might say the same thing but it was a little difficult for me um but I, I what i brought away a positive thing that i brought away was um I like the idea of when somebody is trying to bog you down with questions or trying to reverse the tactic on you, kind of just saying, Hey, okay. Uh, what, what exactly is your point? Like, what, what is it? What is it? Where are you trying to get me to go? Because I know the tactics. So I know what you're trying to do. So let's, let's just cut through the chase and get to the point. And I've actually done that with a, a Bogosian's, some of Bogosian's, you know, disciples, and yeah. it really throws them off because uh, – and, and this and this is actually could be a warning for us too when we're trying to use tactics. When somebody when somebody knows what you're doing and they're just going to, okay, no, let's just skip – let's just skip the drama here. Let's just skip the questions and get to your point. It can throw you off. You're like, whoa, wait a second. 
And oftentimes when you don't have the step by steps, like one, two, three, four, it really throws you off and you can't, uh, you can't defend what you're trying to defend or you can't make the point that you're trying to make. And I've noticed that with Bogosians folks, because they, they have a series of questions that they ask a very specific way. Mm. And if you say, listen, I've read chapter six of Bogosian's manual for creating atheists. I know exactly what you're doing. How about we just have it, an honest conversation? We just state your point for me and, and go from there. And I've done that a couple times and it's really just people like, whoa, wait a second, you know, and then you, then you try to take it a, another, another way, or you try to deal with how they respond. But that's, that's the main thing that I think I probably took away. And it was, I think, right at the beginning of this chapter too. I'm um, not very deep into it. Yeah. Alan, how'd you like this chapter? <laughs> Alan? Yeah. Um, yeah, you predicted it well, John. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, uh, I think Greg did introduce this or add this chapter from other material he took from a different chapter, whatever. Uh, so it was a little bit, I don't know, it wasn't as meaty as I thought some of the other ones were, which is not a problem. It's not like every chapter has to be gold. But um, so the part that I liked the most was that was after the uh, Bogosian stuff, because um, where, where he talks about when a question is not a question, I think that's actually more of a common um, kind of comment or objection that the average person is going to run across. Um, uh, and it's a tough one to sort through. Uh, because I don't know. I mean, I, I found myself getting kind of caught off guard. Well, who do you, who are you to say this? Or, you know, um, you know, what gives you the right to say whatever? And I really, I liked Greg's way of dealing with it, or at least this particular way, which is to try to take that question and try to restate it as a statement. Yeah. And, you know, so, um, I think this is page 135. Yeah. Who's to say? Uh, what gives you the right? And he basically says, gives examples of what those statements yeah. or those questions could mean. It could mean no one could ever know the truth about that. Or one answer is just as good as another, you know, or you're wrong for saying someone else is wrong. In other words, those are the kinds of, that's, that's what those questions aren't really questions. They're meant to just simply state those statements. And if you can figure out what the statement is, that's underlying that supposed question, then you've made a tremendous amount of progress. And I think that you can then see what's wrong with it a lot easier than trying to actually answer the question, which as he points out, isn't a real question, you know? Yeah. And so, and again, the, the, the genius of this whole book is that the way you try to figure out what is the statement behind this question? Well, it's asking Columbo questions, you know, just like, stop the progress that's being, or that the, the person's trying to make with their question and yeah. just ask some Columbo questions to try to understand what, it, what is the point they're trying to make? And then once you figure that out, I think it becomes a lot easier then to see, oh, okay. They're just basically telling me uh, that I'm wrong for suggesting someone else is wrong, you know? Yeah. But then that would make them wrong. Right. So there's a little bit of the suicide tactic being hinted here as well. So um, anyways, I, I, that's the part I appreciate the most. Um, in that chapter. Yeah. So there's, there's um, when, when we sense that there's a leading question, this person's trying to go somewhere, you know, um, there's no, there's no problem with just asking them. Okay. It seems like you want to take this somewhere. You're trying to get, you're trying to make a point. Why don't you just tell me what the point is yeah. and we can talk about it. Right. Uh, now, do you think this is, because we're using leading questions as well. That's what chapter seven was all about, right? Um, so it's not that leading questions are wrong in themselves. Um, do you think that, um, I don't think Greg's being hypocritical, but do you think there's a difference between the way the leading question is being used against us um, that makes it illicit or I guess what's what's the what's yeah. the difference here? Is there something different between Columbo three and the person using leading questions against us? I would I would say I would say no. I would say that if you're talking to somebody who who is uh, kind of like hip to what you're trying to do and you're using Columbo and they just want to kind of 
skip it. I think yeah. it's totally acceptable for them to do that. And, sure. and I, I would even appreciate it, you know, because oftentimes when I'm using Columbo with somebody, I'm, uh, and this is, it doesn't, I'm not trying to be, I want to, oh, man, like I wish that you guys, though you guys, cause you guys know me, you know my heart, but like, I'm trying to give the person, I'm trying to, I'm trying to educate the person and what I'm talking about through my questions and I'm trying to help them come to their own conclusions. And it's not in a conceited, like, I know so much more than you, you know, that's not, that's not the truth. It's, it's, um, but, but if they already know where I'm going and they want to, they want to shave 10 minutes off our conversation, I think that that's fantastic. Um, feel free to do that. But in my experience, the people that I'm talking to don't. And then in my experience, the opposite is true, where if I'm talking to somebody who's trying to use this tactic on me, I can bring it up and then they don't know where to go afterwards. So I don't think it's hypocritical at all. Um, again, let's, let's remember the motive here. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the motive of why we're using tactics, it's not contrived. It's not um, ill-willed. It's because it's I just want to honestly get to know somebody what they believe and why they believe it. And then if I'm able to interject some truth into the conversation. And and I don't think that that's always the case when I'm talking to skeptics, to be honest with you. And yeah. it, it wasn't the case. And, and this is completely anecdotal. Like I'm not, I'm not using it as an argument, but when I was, when I was an ardent atheist arguing Christians in, in I, I, my, my objective was not, to hear a defense or anything rational from the Christian. It was to make them look foolish and stupid and feel foolish and stupid. That was my goal. Like, I'm sorry, you know, but my worldview had a place for that because I didn't view the people that I was speaking with as, as valuable in any real uh, sense of the word. Um, and like I said, that's just me. Uh, I'm not saying that's true of every atheist. Um, but anyways, I don't think it's hypocritical. Yeah, well, Tim, I, your question's a good one. I think, in one sense, no, there's nothing wrong with them asking Columbo type, you know, type one, two, and three questions because, like we've been saying, these are just basic questions that are meant to clarify, that are meant to explain reasons for why you believe what you believe, and they're meant to expose weaknesses. And if we have a weakness in our view, then there's nothing wrong with them exposing that, and there's nothing wrong with us acknowledging, oh yeah, that the way I characterize that view is incorrect or my argument's not good or whatever. That's that's fine. But I think in the examples he gives in this chapter, no, there is something different. Because, for example, in the section that I was talking about where a question's not a question, yeah. they're using that question, well, who are you to say, you know, or what gives you the right? That's actually not a question. But the, the point of that alleged question is to say, you know, no one's justified in saying that one religious view is better than another. Well, that's just that's just false, right? Or no one could ever know the truth about something. Well, that's just false as well. So uh, it, when when they use a question that sounds like a Columbo question to uh, advance an incorrect view or to try to corner you like that, then no, I think it is illicit. And that's not the point that we're trying to do. We're not trying to trick people up. This is not clever sophistry. It's not like empty rhetoric intended to, to catch someone illicitly like the Peter Bogosians, you know, it's to try to discover truth, you know? So I would say that there is a difference when the intent of the question is, well, there's a difference between us or anyone asking questions to get at the truth, to find out someone else's view, to understand their reasoning or to point out an obvious objection or weakness in someone's view versus asking a question that really isn't a question, but meant to simply, you know, state something that is just false, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and Greg makes this point, you know, with his uh, discussion with Chopra and uh, Dr. Chopra asked something like, <laughs> so you just think everyone who doesn't agree with you is going to hell. And, and of course there's so much that needs to be unpacked there. That's not a fair question, right? That's not the kind of, I'm a genuine seeker of, you know, truth. I want to get to know your view. Now, this was meant, I mean, there was no way that Greg could answer that question without looking really bad, you know? And so sometimes those questions um, are put that way. And I don't want to assume Deepak's motives, but it just, I mean, that didn't seem like a fair question um, to ask. 
So uh, this has been good. Um, so have, just check. Can, can, can I bring something up? Yeah, go for it. Have you guys seen? Uh, there's the new. There's a new documentary that. It, oh man, the American Gospel. Crown oh yeah, Thorns. Have you seen it, Alan? I saw that. Wasn't there a first one? I think I saw the first one. The first one was okay. I thought it was really, really long. Yeah, uh, dude, Mike Winger's actually interviewed in it quite a bit, and um, and I really appreciated this one because they spent a significant amount of time speaking to the people that they were talking about, the deconversion guys and the um, uh, man, what's oh man, this upcoming rethink is all about it. I should uh. Aggressive Christianity. Christianity. So Alicia uh, Childers is in it. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and uh, and and it was it was really great because they they showed what the progressive Christians and the, these guys who deconverted right are, are they 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 interviewed them so you got it from their mouth and then you had you know Paul Washer and and Mike Winger and Alicia Childers responding um, to them and and I really. Uh, I really liked it because it trying to tying it back to the tactics and Alan, which you had just said is oftentimes um, what's what's being brought up isn't the real issue or it's kind of a caricature of, you know, they're talking about um, atonement, you know, and, and God being a, um, a child abuser or cosmic child abuser. Yeah, right? divine child abuse, yeah. And the way that these people are defining the atonement is just not, I don't believe it either, but if they had somebody in their life that they were talking to that knew tactics, I feel like they would have, some of them maybe like, like these young guys who are walking away from Christianity. Uh, yeah. I feel like if they had some people in their lives that were thoughtful and had, had a game plan and a conversation when these guys were saying certain things, not right now necessarily, but you know, five, 10 years ago, um, there maybe would have been some headway made and I, and um, because what they're saying just isn't what we believe. Um, anyways, it was just, it's a, I, I recommend the, I mean, it's like three hours long, Yeah, so, but it's really well done. And it, I think it's better than the first one. Is it on YouTube? It's just, no. uh, well, it's just on their website. Okay. Um, you can, <laughs> the, the shorter one is on their website. You can purchase. I just bought the, the longer one because why not? You know, I watch it when I'm falling asleep at night. <laughs> yeah. So I think and maybe, John, maybe we uh, post the, the links to those um, in the chat afterwards. Yeah, I can do that. Some people are asking. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think this goes in line with what um, John was uh, just saying. We can use leading questions to lead um people towards the truth. Right. And, uh, and we mentioned this earlier, you know, there's that quote from, uh, Blaise Pascal, people are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they themselves discovered yeah. than by those which come into their minds by others. And I think what he means is if I just make statements and tell you what to believe, well, you're likely to put your guard up, but if I can ask you leading questions and you're agreeing with me all the way, you know, like Greg does with this lawyer at the bookstore, yeah. don't you think that people who commit moral crimes ought to be punished. And he's like, yeah, definitely. I'm a lawyer. You know, of course, people <laughs> guys are all the time for doing that. Have you ever committed any moral crimes? Well, yeah, I, I guess, you know, yeah. and so you get the person to come to the conclusion themselves. It's not a trick. They're answering the question. I didn't tell them how to answer. Um, and so uh, I think there's a way we can even do that with brothers and sisters in Christ when it comes to, um, you know, foolish things that that end up different doctrines that can can end up being um, make their way into the church. And, and then there's people like in the progressive camp. And again, we can ask these kinds of questions to them as well. So uh, it's it's helpful across the board. Um, there's uh, oh, we had uh, you guys know, Scott Klusendorf was in the chat. Great job. Yeah. He shared the link too. Hey, Scott. Hey Scott, I appreciate sharing the link too. So more people, and if you're if you're watching and you want to uh, share these things, then maybe more people will end up jumping on, which would be awesome. Uh, I did see some questions in here. Yeah, uh, go back here. a little bit, Ryan. Oh yeah. How about this one? Um, 
would it be a good would it be good to acknowledge the question is valid and good like here's an example where did king get his wife but to refocus on one topic at a time what do you guys think yeah absolutely yeah i mean i'm not sure exactly um well it seems like there could be a couple of questions there but if you're if you're talking if you're having a discussion about something and you or some someone's raised a challenge you're you're answering that challenge and rather than them saying oh okay thanks for sharing that or acknowledging your point or offering counter evidence instead of doing that they just say oh well well what about you know Cain like where did he get his wife and they just like now jump off to another topic sometimes I think the best thing to do at that point is to do what Ryan was suggesting um, and that is and and I would, I would point to narrating the debate. I think that's the appropriate yeah. tactic there, which is to give, say, hold on a second, give them a third person perspective of what's just going on. You know, and you say, wait a minute, you just raised a really good challenge. I began answering that challenge, or at least I was attempting to. And instead of you acknowledging that or offering counter evidence or us kind of concluding that, you jump to another question about Cain and where he got where he got his wife, you know? So let's let's first finish this before we jump to another point. Like yeah. I that's Definitely. I, mean, I, I do that all the time because I do get frustrated that you can never conclude one subject or question or challenge before you move on to another one. And some yeah. people just like to throw out challenge after challenge after challenge, hoping that, you know, something sticks, but never attempting or really being concerned about resolving any one of them. Yeah. And that takes a lot of, in my, <clears throat> that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of experience in trying to keep the, the discussion on, uh, on target. But, or I should say discipline, you know, it's just, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a discipline that's very valuable to learn. Like if you can learn how to keep a, uh, keep a conversation focused on the topic, because then you can also like, like I'll even throw in the fact, say, okay, like we just talked about, okay, the, the, the existence of an objective moral standard. So, so are we in agreement now that there's an objective moral standard and now we can go off onto where, where that comes from. But first, I don't want to miss this step. Um, but I also thought the question was kind of asked from the point of view. Sometimes it's, I mean, sometimes people ask good questions and yeah. it's important. Like we got to remember that we're having conversations with people. That's what we want to be doing. Um, so it's important just to say, hey, you know what? That's a great question. You know, I struggled with that too. Uh, yeah. Here's yeah. here's where I here's where I where I ran into trouble when answering it from a naturalist naturalistic perspective, and here's where I had to turn. You know, let me now let me answer you, or or you can ask more questions, what like whatever. But I think it's charitable to uh, to acknowledge when people have hard questions to say that's that's a very good and difficult question to answer. Yeah. Then yeah, that's good. Um, so we, you guys want to take, uh, questions for a few more minutes? No. We'll have <laughs> you have no choice, but, uh, this, that's a, that's a loaded question. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go for it. So, yeah. What else we got? Well, we'll take more questions if people want to throw them in. Um, I'm seeing another one here from Ryan. Um, he says the question is all those that don't believe like you do are going to hell. That's the one we brought up with deep. Oh, deep yeah. Uh, um, would it be a good turn to, to turn the claim in on itself and ask the person is all the people that disagree with you are arrogant and bigoted? So you could ask, well, are all the people who don't agree with you, are they arrogant and bigoted? You think that would be a, I mean that, wh what do you guys think? What do you guys think? Well, I'm not, well, it dep I mean, I guess, Okay, it depends on whether this conversation is referring to the actual conversation that Greg was having with Chopra. Because if so, I think the answer would be no, because the reason why Greg didn't want to go to that particular question was because the context of it was was not to the point that they were making. It was on a, it was on a television show. It would have taken too much time to unpack. So yeah. for that, that's the reason why Greg said no. He didn't want to pursue that question at that at that point at that moment. But also yeah. the question I would have is, well, why would you suggest that they are uh, are all people that disagree with you, arrogant and bigoted? I mean, I, I guess it's presuming that they were suggesting that's the case about you. But I wouldn't yeah. go around and say that about them if they never, you know, suggested that. So you just got to be careful that you don't come across as, you know, just trying to, um, you know, do an ad hominem like they're trying to do on you. Yeah, I think it's always best just to be honest 
and and truthful and it goes it, uh, for me it just keeps coming back to the fact that um you know they they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another right that's what jesus says and we want to be loving and charitable um and i often try to at least give people the benefit of the doubt so if they say something that doesn't sound right to me um i'll, I'll just say well why would you why would you ask me that like what mm-hmm. what have i said that that would think would, would have you think one that that's what i believe in two that 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 point of view or that statement's going to further our conversation at all you know um i'd rather just spend our time talking about you know what we were talking about um but i find that I, in this instance and, and and i'm like a, i'm i'm much different than greg and probably even maybe you both in my interactions with people but i'm just a little bit more direct with people and i'm just honest with them i have trouble not being so so when when somebody says something like that about, you know, so are you telling me that everybody who believes differently than you is going to hell? And it's like, well, I mean, what, I don't know how you want me to answer that, to be honest with you, because I don't think it's a, I don't think the, I don't think the the spirit of the question is in line with the spirit of the conversation I want to have. Um, you know, and, and I'd like to, I'd like to spend our time talking about more profitable things that, that maybe we can both walk away from this thinking about as opposed to, you know, throwing darts. Can we do that? You know, that's yeah. usually how I'd, 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 and then you just move right on, you know, and you address the issue. It's, you kind of help them in my hoping, help them see like, you know, you don't need to offend me or ask uh, leading questions like this. Um, let's just have a, I just want to have a conversation with you, man. Um, if you don't want to have that, that's fine. We can stop. It goes back to the, one of the things in the book that we, uh, from chapter eight or whatever, you know, this conversations and obviously it's stalled. It's time for the walk away. Maybe we can take this up next time. So anyways. Okay. Uh, Patty says. Wait, before you go to that, Tim, just also uh, a related question in the chat that's related to what we're just talking about from Laura about recommending a good video or uh, or book. Anything by Alan Schleeman. No, no, no. no. I was going to say Greg's got a book on relativism called, yeah, relativism, called Feet Firmly Planted in Midair, who he co-authored with uh, Francis Beckwith who I saw joined in the uh, sort of watching us earlier as well. Um, so that would be a good thing. And Greg debated a professor actually on moral relativism, if I don't, if I recall. Um, yeah. Truth? Was it on truth? Yeah, just in uh, and I, I think relativism came out. I just, now I'm trying to remember though, if it's not available sure. publicly or not, but anyways, I recommend, book. yeah, I'd recommend Greg's book. Can I tell a really cool story about that book real quick? No. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. So I'll go fast. So I just know Patty is waiting to get an answer to Yeah, yeah, question. I know. Yeah, I told you about that. You answer your question. But uh, it's just really cool because God's so good. And um, one night my mom was here visiting in California and we're talking and my mom is a moral relativist and I'm trying to help her uh, see the, uh, the collapse of her, her moral system here and and um, and at one point she really kind of spanked me, and it actually goes to the, the the spirit of the book and what I'm what I'm trying to get at as far as our demeanor. She actually said to me, "Hey, John, you know you 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 come across as very knowledgeable, and you obviously are passionate about this, but but sometimes you could be a jerk," <laughs> which is what she said to me, which is totally true, you know. And, and I was like, ah, you know. So I apologized to her. I said, "I'm really sorry, mom." And then we we slowed the conversation down, and I was able to point these things to her like point them out to her about where her system's kind of failing her worldview. And the, that evening, my kids were, were playing in the guest room where she was staying and all my books are in there. And it just happens that they left that book on her bed that night, more uh, relativism feet firmly planted in midair. And my mom went to bed that night. Yeah. And she, she read half of it and she actually came out the next morning and she said, you know what, did you, did you know this was in there? And I said, I had no idea, mom, like the kids were messing around. And she said, I think you might be right. You know, I think my worldview is it doesn't work. And I was just like, oh, this is awesome. Like it, it, that's just so cool. So, anyways, a great resource. And um, and also we don't want to be jerks for Jesus, especially to our moms. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> really the takeaway. Anyone, from really, yeah. Don't be a jerk to your mom. No, uh, you. what do you say to elders who say that apologetics undermines the work of the Holy Spirit? How did you come to that conclusion? There you go. There you no, go. I mean, I, I'm not joking. I mean, it's kind of, I'm, I'm, it is a little bit funny, but no, it's a real, I mean, I'm serious. Like I, I'd want to know how is it that they see that 
apologetics undermines the work of the Holy Spirit. I would, I would want to know the reasoning and their explanation for how that happens. Is, Is that it possible yeah. to undermine the work of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> well, I mean, apparently people think you can. But I think I think the point they're trying to, well, I'm going to guess here, and I wouldn't normally do this if I was actually talking to them, because I would ask them, how did you come to that conclusion? And I would let them speak for themselves. But my guess is that they probably are saying that if you use apologetics, then you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work. You know, you can't, you can't argue someone to the kingdom, you know, kind of thing. Is that, is that what your guys are guessing is they probably mean by that? Probably. Yeah. But of course that assumes that the Holy Spirit doesn't use means like apologetics to accomplish his ends. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, he uses um, us loving other people. He uses us serving other people. He uses us talking to other people. And of course he clearly used the apostle Paul and others in the new Testament who used apologetics and yeah. the Holy Spirit used them powerfully to have a massive impact. <laughs> I would li- I, I, I would get them to open up after asking those questions, Acts 17, verses 1 to 4. Yeah. And it said he explained and gave evidence, and, and it says some were persuaded. You know, like, I mean, this is Paul doing apologetics, reasoning from the scripture. Or Jesus. I mean, talking yeah. to anytime he messed with the Pharisees or anybody, you know, I mean— I mean, any anytime he addressed anyone, he was doing he was doing he was doing tactics. He was asking questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But definitely, the first question I would ask them is to put the burden of proof back on them because they're the ones who made an incredible claim. Uh, when skeptics suddenly switch the topic, do we want to identify um, that they are trying to pop smoke and retreat from the previous topic? I think, Alan, you you made reference yeah. to this a little bit in narrating the discussion. So yeah. this was chapter... I don't know, chapters back. Yeah, a couple of chapters ago, we looked at this. And all you're doing is, it's like you're a fly on the wall. And you're going to explain what just happened in the conversation. And you just tell them. And I, I do this with my Jehovah's Witness friends all the time because they are notorious for changing the subject. They love to jump from verse to verse and chapter and book to book in the Bible to try and make their point. It's so disconnected. And so what I do is I, I force them to stay on topic and usually stay in a certain passage and figure out the context and what's really going on in that. And, uh, and I point out to them, look at, you can't just start, you can't jump all over the place to try to find your proof text. Um, and, uh, and here's what I think you're doing. And it's, it's confusing the issue. And um, when you don't know how to answer this challenge about, you know, John eight fifty eight, you know, um, in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, before Abraham was, mm-hmm. I am, you're going to, you're going to jump somewhere else um, to show that, you know, Jesus isn't divine. Well, no, let's talk about this passage because we believe in all of scripture. So um, that's just a, an example of Jehovah's Witnesses, but you can, you can use that with anybody, skeptics, especially especially and chapter, uh, chapter six is where he talks about it i just found it perfect um how about this ashton what books papers would you recommend to help us better be able to answer most objections i know tax is high on the list do you guys have a favorite it, for- it, well if if i see scott klusendorf you know just commented you have to mention his book um <laughs> because the case of- uh, <laughs> so when it comes to the pro-choice discussion yeah if you're not just like if you're looking to answer like it says most objections but if you're looking for a book to answer any of the uh objections brought by the the pro-choice you know community you've got to read it's a case for life by by klusendorf um i read that yeah. book i used to be pro-abortion like I mean, straight up pro-abortion. When I read that book, it changed uh, it changed a lot for me. And if you want to learn how to use, be very tactical. Uh, Alan's gonna go get it right now, but I have it somewhere here. Um, but I mean, that's definitely a book that I'd go to. Tactics, along with uh, Case for Life. Yeah, Blue's book, Case for Life. Uh, yeah. This is probably the best popular level book. If you want a more scholarly book. Um, Francis Beckwith, who was also in watching us earlier, I don't know if he still is, 
But he's got a book called Def uh, Defending Life. Is that still in print? Defending Life. Well, no, there was um, – he had Politically Correct Death a while ago. And then I think now Defending Life is the more up to date one. Um, but more generally to the question, because I don't know why we're talking about the pro-choice, pro-life stuff. But if you want to look at just most objections, you're probably not going to find it in one book. Although there is a really good book. And I don't know. If, I'm interested if you guys have read it. It's by a pastor named Mark Clark, based in um, based in Canada, out west. Um, it's called "The Problem of God." Have you guys read it? I have. It is one, it is one of my favorite apologetics books, and it's this is not a professional apologist, but he knows his stuff. I mean, he's citing Planting God and everybody else, um, the the Christian scholars to to um, make his arguments. And uh, it's really informed book. And so Problem of God, I, I would recommend. Um, Any others on just general apologetics? This one's real good. Beyond Opinion. <clears throat> yeah. By Ravi Zacharias. Um, and I think Ravi is an editor, if I remember correctly. I haven't read it in a long time. But I think that it's... Um, so let me look real quick at the index. Yeah, so each chapter... I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's written by by other authors within RZIM and out without, but you know, challenges from science, challenges from Islam. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's. I think it's hard to find a single book that addresses lots of objections. You know, I mean, tactics is the one that, that's actually. I mean, I know it's. I know you're saying besides tactics, but the reason why tactics is high on the list is because it's not about just answering any particular objections. It's about learning. The yeah. tactics of how to answer any objection. So you can literally apply these tactics to any subject matter, whether you're talking about evolution or God's existence or uh, bioethics or abortion or Islam or whatever. So that's that's the beauty of tactics. But I'd say if you want to just get a general knowledge of the arguments for and against, then I'm not sure I'd recommend any any one book other than just getting different books and resources on different subjects, like yeah. you know. Klusendorf and Beckwith on all the abortion pro-life stuff, you know, uh, maybe the Discovery Institute authors for like evolution, intelligent design stuff, and just kind of going through all these different areas and, you know, uh, broadening your area of knowledge. Uh, Klusendorf has a really good um, description of narrating the debate in the comments. Really good stuff. Oh, yeah. So nice check spot. that out. Um, <laughs> That's yeah, really good. So that's that's what we were referring to. And yeah. then um, there's also Chris had put up Coco debate. This was a debate we were thinking of John Baker in Calgary. Oh, yeah. Does, yes. Thanks, Chris. Oh, no. So search that. Maybe there's a audio of it. I don't think there's a video. I think there's audio. So that's uh, that's sweet. Um uh, anything else? Oh yeah, here? Uh, Baker's Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics. Oh, that's true. Oh, good. Yeah, Paula, that's good. Um, Geisler is—he's yeah, just there a, you go. this monster. Yeah, he's the man. He's <laughs> written like eighty books, and uh, and he is—he's probably addressed pretty much every challenge that's been out there in one of his books or another. Yeah, but if this this is a one good. This is just a good resource to have in general. Because yeah. so it's it's so huge, and oh. it's like an encyclopedia on apologetics. So it is a good, but it's not going to go into super incredible you know depth on everything. Yeah, yeah. Another one um, that Paula uh, references here is philosophical foundation for a Christian worldview. Yeah, by J.P. Moreland and and William Lane Craig, and that uh, that's going to go deeper. Who who, um, who are they? I don't know. Uh, no namers. Yeah, just just a bunch of no namers. Weird. Um, Grutis has a decent book on um, apologetics as well, a general apologetics text. Yeah, that's real good. I think we covered most of them. We tried to hammer through the question, so we did pretty well. Did you guys see one that we didn't get to? Um, no, I. I did a whole live 
uh, session uh, maybe a week or two ago rec of, of just book recommendations. And okay. I, think I went through like, dude, I, I think I did like 40 books. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey. Right. <laughs> so um, if you're interested in some book recommendations, then you want to definitely find that live. It would just be on the Facebook page, right? STR's Facebook page. Scroll down to videos and you'll find all the different lives that have been going on. Oh, our, our website, by the way, are we still answering that question about general papers? Like our website has all kinds of answers, articles, videos on all kinds of challenges. And our and where channel. might people find our website? It's like S T I forgot the rest, but it's like S T no, something. Not T. Is that T? Is it S A? S A. S A. S A D. There's going to be people. S A D dot org. <laughs> there's going to be some people on the chat. Yeah, we can joke about that. Familiar with STR? Okay. STR.org. STR.org. And it's actually a new website and it's completely rad. But we're not promoting it just yet. <laughs> Amazing. But also, um, our YouTube channel, um, STR videos, we, have, we do a whole bunch of, you know, um, arguments on different subjects answer challenges, so on and so forth. So that's also a good resource. Yeah. And if you want Tim's cell phone number, I'd be happy to give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. He answers a lot of questions, usually around 3 a.m. when he wakes up for his quiet time. Yeah. That's so, right. Yeah. 556-241-1193. And um, yeah, 3 a.m. I think is the best time when he's, when he's most awake and ready and free. Because then it's good to yeah. sleep and stuff like that. Yeah. Just blow up the cell. <laughs> yes, we like Stephen Meyer. Well, I like Stephen Meyer. Paul is asking. Oh, yeah. Ryan's got a yeah, good signature one. in the cell. Darwin's doubt. And then, and yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's that. right. Turk's book. I don't think faith to, a, to be an atheist is such a good book. It covers so much as you as you go through the, the 12. He goes through 12 steps to argue that Christianity is true. Um, so that's a really good book. Yeah, Ashton knows that five five six is not a Toronto area code. Yeah, but, but he doesn't know that you got that phone when you were living in that other city, which I won't name. So sometimes yeah. the area code's different than where you actually live. <laughs> oh yeah, Bill Craig's reasonable faith. Well, we're going. Oh wow, we're going back. Okay, so I'm going to then call out uh, scaling the secular city. Oh, dude, yes. Yeah. Oh. When I was in a Christian, that's the book somebody gave me that I read through. Yeah. So just we should read like, a lot. We're, we're, we're rambling now. We should probably end this. Right? We are. We are. We should let people know, though, that um, the plan is, I mean, this has been pretty successful. Um, quite a few people have, uh, you know, been reading along with us and been interacting in chats and watching the videos. Um we may, uh, when this is done, because this is session three, I think um, we're just doing six sessions in total. And so uh, the plan is to do another book after this one. And our hope is to drag Amy Hall um, into this. Uh, she's been a little sick. And, um, and so the, the plan is that she would be involved and the four of us would tackle the next book. So. schooled by Amy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. yeah. she's, she's the rock star. <laughs> He's the rock star. So we're um, so grateful for all you guys for hanging out with us. It's been fun. Sorry that we uh, jumped in, uh, jumped on late. There were some technical difficulties. And, and so we apologize for that. But we will be here next week. We will. At 6, 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. God willing, no technical difficulties. And we will, we will be addressing chapters 10... 11 and 12, I believe. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Um, any final words, fellas? No, but those are really great tactics coming up. Yeah. No, we're going to, it's going to be fun. Yeah. All right, guys. We love you. God bless you. Take care.